Our program will begin in five minutes. Our program is about to begin, please.
It took some tears, oh, but together we were strong. And now I feel a burning beat inside my heart. Living in fear, I couldn't see the rising sun. Just felt the weight of the world every time I tried to run. But you helped remind me who I am and where I'm from. And now I feel a burning beat in my heart. Good afternoon, EFT. Please welcome to the stage the president of the Washington Teachers Union, Miss Jackie Pogue Lyons. I think my people are in the audience. And welcome to the 2023 AFT Teach Conference. I am Jacqueline Pogue Lyons, and I am the president of the Washington Teachers Union, <laughs> AFT Local 6. Before being elected president, I was a proud WTU member for 29 years while teaching in several DC public schools as both a kindergarten teacher and an ELL teacher. And I know we have some proud WTU members in the room today, so let's hear from our local six members in the house. On behalf of all the WTU members, I am pleased to welcome everyone here to Washington, DC, our nation's capital. And I understand that many of you have already been engaged with yesterday's pre-teach events. More than 110 K through 12 AFT members went to 73 meetings in the House and Senate yesterday as part of AFT's Lobby Day. It was the largest ever advocacy day on the Hill. They made our voices heard advocating for teachers' pay and other issues. Thank you very much for all you do. Your insight and actions will help support public school students across the country. Here in DC, WTU is working hard to support our students and members of our community. One example of this commitment was in 2021, we helped President Weingarten launch the AFT's Reading Opens the World campaign at a local DC public school with all AT AFT officers attending, as well as First Book President, CEO, Kyle Zimmer, and AFL-CIO President, Liz Schuler. Then, in 2022, we distributed more than 40,000 books, and I know it was 40,000 because I sorted a lot of them, um, to help give out books to students, families, educators, and school staff in partnership with, the, with local fire and police departments, DC public school libraries, Washington Tennis and Education Foundation, and several city council members, even Carla Hernandez Matz from the United Teachers of Dade even participated. But this is what unionists and educators do in our communities. We work together with our union members, community members, and leaders to support and uplift each other. And speaking of supporting students and families, educators and school staff very shortly will be hearing from two 
of the most inspiring, capable people I know who work tirelessly to support all of us. But before they come onto the stage, I want to remind you of a few key things. And remember, I'm a kindergarten teacher. A few key things while you're at TEACH. Please look at the screen for the AFT Code of Conduct. You can also find it on the first page of the program, badges. I want you to remind you to always wear your badge. Your badge is your ticket into workshops, general sessions, receptions, and other events at TEACH. And I want to remind you that during conferences like this, like this one, it's essential to be cautious about certain groups that may not have the best intentions. These bad actors may approach attendees at bars and restaurants to engage in discussions over controversial topics while secretly recording your conversations. These record, yes, boo. I'm gonna call it stranger danger. These recordings could be selectively edited to create embarrassing situations and support a narrative that seeks to undermine public education. To stay safe, be mindful of strangers who seem eager to steer conversations toward controversial subjects. Trust your instincts, and if you encounter someone whose behavior raises concern, don't hesitate to inform a staff member. And if you want to engage in conversation, follow us on social media using the hashtag teach23. You can also connect with the AFT Teach app. Go to the App Store, download the CVENT Events app, and enter AFT Teach 2023 in the search field. You can also find details about all of these things in the TEACH program. Over the next few days, I hope you enjoy our beautiful city and this wonderful conference. More than 70 workshops, lunch and learn sessions, and many institutes are offered that provide many new skills, research strategies that you can take right back to your classroom to help your students succeed and thrive. And don't forget to visit the AFT initiatives area where you can complete the AFT vote scavenger hunt to win prizes, take action, and learn about all the benefits of belonging to the best union in the world, the AFT. And everything from the latest Share My Lessons resources to information on AFT's trauma counseling program and more. I want to remind you that we have a fantastic panel on literacy, my love, immediately after Randy's keynote, so stay in the room because you won't want to miss it. And again, from my heart, I'd like to welcome you to the AFT Teach 2023 conference and again to Washington, D.C. Thank you. This is an honor. Please give a warm welcome to AFT's special guest, U.S. Secretary of Education, Dr. Miguel Cardona, escorted to the stage by AFT President Randy Whitegarden. to be here. You know, in preparation, I, I told my wife, I said, um, hey, I'm going to be speaking at the AFT Teach Conference in D.C. You know what she told me? She said, you better. <laughs> She's a paying AFT member herself. <laughs> Shout out to Marissa. It's great to have so many outstanding educators in D.C., but to be honest, we could use a few more teachers to address some of the misbehavior in this town. I know, I know it's hotter than hot out there, but it's nothing compared to the heat you've been taking these days. 
But it, ha it has been the highlight of my month to spend, spend uh, some time with our nation's teachers. I've been with school counselors in Atlanta. I was with educators in Orlando, CTE instructors in Augusta. It's great to be with the profession that makes all other professions possible. Yeah. Let them know. Let them know. But as I said a couple weeks ago in Orlando, we've witnessed, we've witnessed an intentional, toxic effort to disrespect teachers, to divide families, and to demonize students who are different. So let me start by saying something that you don't hear often enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> De nada. Thank you for going above and beyond to be there for all, all of your students. As I always say, all means all. Thank you for showing up at a time when their needs have never been greater and the noise surrounding you has never been louder. Thank you for handing out 1.5 million books during a year. Yeah, give it up for yourselves. 1.5 million books when others are focused on banning books. Thank you for staying high when others go low. I also want to thank President Randy Weingarten for her fearless leadership. Thank you, Randy. No one fights harder for you than, no, no one fights harder for students and educators than you. And by the way, what an honor it is to be walked onto the stage by the most dangerous person in the world. Ooh. Dangerous for what? For wanting beautiful and safe schools? For wanting higher literacy rates? For championing full service community schools? If you fear a strong woman, you're picking on the wrong profession. <laughs> Education is full of strong women. So let me ask you, what's more dangerous, fighting for health and well-being of students or blocking life-saving gun safety laws that could keep children and educators safe? What's more dangerous, educators working to create inclusive and welcoming schools or politicians demonizing LGBTQ kids who already have it tough enough? What's more dangerous, fighting? for better conditions and fair compensation for teachers, or stoking hate and distrust in an effort to burn public education to the ground. You know, these attacks on education remind me of something I used to tell my kids. It's one of my favorite go-to lines as a parent. But before I tell you the line that I'm talking about, I'm going to test you to see if you know it. But please don't worry, it's not a standardized test. <laughs> You're not going to be rated. I'm not going to give you anything to fill in. All right. Who here knows Newton's third law? Just raise your hand. All right, I got one hand here. Any science teachers in the house? All right. Newton's third law. I guarantee you that you've heard it. For every action, there's an... Wow. <laughs> You knew it. You just didn't know it was Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Let that sink in for a second. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. As a parent, I used to use this all the time. If one of my kids got in trouble, they'd have a consequence. Then they'd argue with me that it isn't fair. That's when I come in with the line, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Then you know how it is. You get the eye rolls and the sucking of the teeth, you know. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. In the Cardona house, it's sort of Poppy's version of, you mess around, you're going to find out. <laughs> we, we see a lot of efforts to mess around with public education today. Look at, the state, look at the statewide school voucher programs, like we've seen in Indiana and Arizona. When you look closer, you find it's mainly wealthier families getting their private school tuition bills paid. 
while schools and communities with the greatest needs have 95 degree classrooms and substitute teachers virtually in every classroom. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Or look at what the House Republicans are pushing, a budget that would kick 220,000 teachers out of our nation's schools, 80% cut in Title I. They want to claw back the American Rescue Plan dollars, which not one of them voted for, but they don't mind showing up in nice suits when there's a ribbon cutting. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Their cuts would destroy public schools. Or take these so-called anti-woke laws, which censor teachers and librarians and strip them of their agency, trying to rewrite history and promote exclusion and bigotry. Look, we already had one insurrection. We don't need any more. We need, to, we need public education to keep democracy alive. That's what we do. Some of these politicians attacking, attacking public education, they're going to learn. You play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Colleagues, we have districts where one or two ideologues armed with megaphones and rich donors are overriding school librarians and educators with decades of experience in the name of parental rights. But it's not parental rights. That's not what it is. These are extremists working to whitewash history and censor educators at the expense of our students. You want parents' rights? How about the parents' right to have their child attend a school where they feel welcome the way God made them? How about the parents' rights to know their kids won't be gunned down with an assault weapon in the classroom or while walking to school? My message to them, stop protecting AR-15s more than you're protecting our students. Thank you. And don't get me started on wanting teachers to carry guns. If they don't even trust you to pick out books, stop talking. How about the parents' right to have a well-resourced neighborhood school instead of seeing their tax dollars go to vouchers? How about the parents' right to make sure their children have fully staffed schools with highly qualified teachers, not a rotating cast of substitute teachers Not a cast of substitute teachers because their state has no problem with their teachers making less than $40,000 a year. How about the parents' right to have their children learn the true history of our country? Yeah. Including the black experience. Yeah. Even if it means, even if it means teaching about the parts of our history that we're not proud of, I'm very proud of our Vice President who's on her way to Jacksonville, Florida now to address the ridiculous passage of some of the curricular expectations in Florida. We can teach the tragedies and the triumphs of American history and still instill pride in our country. As a parent, as a teacher, and as a former principal, I know strong and productive relationships between teachers and parents are vital to student success. This fabricated attempt to divide our schools and families is not going to work. In fact, we know schools unite families and neighborhoods, and we're going to make sure that a strong education system unites our country. No matter, no matter what race, what faith, what income level or political leaning, nothing unites us more than our shared hopes for our children. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And those working to divide our schools, there's a particular reaction they want. These shenanigans, these culture wars, combined with decades of financial neglect, seek to stoke division and sow distrust in the very institution of public education. At least 
four presidential candidates are talking about eliminating the Department of Education. Even the last Secretary of Education is using her millions to fund privatizing our schools. But we're not going to let that happen. Then we're not going to let that happen. Look, this isn't about a woke or anti-woke. This is about our need to wake up. This, the need to create a reaction that's even bigger than the actions attacking public schools. We need to get back on offense and reclaim the narrative about our public schools. Public education is the foundation of opportunity in America. It is and it has been the great equalizer. Public schools and public state colleges are the reason this Puerto Rican first generation college kid from an economically from an economically depressed community can now advise the President of the United States. Public education. Public education. Public education gives our democracy a fighting chance. At the Department of Education, we're committed to lifting you in the teaching profession. Because we don't have enough acronyms in education, I came up with the ABCs of teaching. All right? Listen, A stands for agency. Let's treat educators like the professionals they are. You know what you're doing. You, you, just, need, you just need the agency to get it done. Educators deserve a seat at the decision-making table because they know what's best for their students. Second to parents, teachers know best what the students' needs are. B, better working conditions. Better working conditions means giving you enough planning time to learn collaboratively, just like every other profession. It means high-quality professional development during work hours, so, right? <laughs> during work hours, so you don't have to choose. So you don't have to choose between professional growth or seeing your family. And it also means supporting learning by hiring more counselors, mental health professionals, and creating wraparound support for students. We're focusing on this in the Biden-Harris administration, investing $2 billion to train and hire mental health professionals and help schools build positive school cultures, which the evidence shows improves learning. I applaud the AFT for fighting for full-service community schools because they work. <laughs> schools are already the center of communities. Full-service community schools embrace that. They're the one-stop shop for students and families to access health care, summer and after school programs, and adult education, and they work. Just like Randy showed me when we went to White Plains, New York. And I've seen it in everywhere from Allentown, Pennsylvania to Santa Fe, New Mexico. In January, President Biden secured a spending bill that increases community school funding from 75 to 150 million dollars and we're not going to stop fighting. Our vision is to double the number of community schools across America because we know they work. And last but not least, we have the letter C, and that stands for competitive salaries. Competitive salaries. <laughs> Teachers earn 24% less than other college graduates. Pay our teachers what they deserve. As of last school year, 35 states in our country started their teachers with a salary of less than $45,000. 17 states started their teachers with a salary below $40,000. Teachers in many places qualify for state aid. Let's stop normalizing teachers having to bartend and drive Uber to make ends meet. If we want to raise the bar and lead the world, let's ensure teacher pay matches the essential work they do. Weren't we calling them essential when the last guy shut down our schools? And look, 
Uh, let me tell you, you can lift teacher you can lift teacher salaries without tying it to voucher programs. Maryland and Idaho have shown us in your budget you don't have to have money in, for voucher programs and then uh, higher teacher salaries just so that they're happy while you're trying to push voucher programs. And teachers, I'm tired of the normalized martyrdom. Yes, you can advocate for a livable wage and still be student-centered. In fact, fighting for competitive salaries will ensure that our schools stay healthy. You shouldn't feel guilty standing up for decent wages. Don't mistake our selflessness with submission. When we invest in the profession, we invest in our students and we invest in our nation. As Secretary of Education from day one, I work to make sure that we're not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. In addition to the $30 billion dedicated to staffing with the American Rescue Plan, this year we're investing $2.7 billion in teacher development, recruitment, and retention programs. And that includes funding to train more teachers of colors and multilingual educators. We all need to work to make sure, we all need to work to make sure that our workforce reflects the beautiful diversity of the students we serve. Y sí, ya es tiempo de aprender otro idioma en los Estados Unidos. Yeah. We also fixed the dysfunctional public service loan forgiveness program. I want to, yeah, I want to say thank you to AFT for helping so many educators apply. We went, at the federal level, we went from 7,000 people ever qualifying for PSLF in four years to for giving $45 billion worth of student loans for 653,000 public servants in the last two and a half years. And I, was, and I was very proud to announce last week, we announced another $39 billion in debt relief for over 800,000 borrowers nationwide. As DJ Khaled would say, as DJ Khaled would say, another one. <laughs> We're up to 100, as an administration, the Biden-Harris team is up to $113 billion in debt relief, and we're just warming up. Our Raise the Bar, Lead the World plan focuses on not only recovering academically, but reimagining a better system. It focuses on laying a foundation of mental health supports for students and for educators. It focuses on eliminating the teacher shortage, on giving students a chance on a global stage through multilingualism and college and career pathways. While others try to destroy public education, we have a plan forward. Check it out at ed.gov for more information. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be here because so many AFT members are behind what's working in education. You spent many years reclaiming the promise. Now, together, let's reclaim the narrative. In each one of your schools, magic happens daily. Whether it's a helping, kid, helping a kid see the potential that they have when they didn't see it themselves. Or AFT members holding panels on how to increase family engagement and organize for community schools. Your focus on culturally responsive teaching and civil discourse. Or now your focus on addressing loneliness by focusing on the impacts of social media. You are making a difference. We cannot be afraid to speak out. We cannot be silent in the face of these corrosive attacks on education. It's our turn to drive the action. It's our turn to reclaim the narrative. It's our turn to turn up the heat. This is our moment, and our kids are watching. We need to be very clear, man. You poke the bear, if you threaten the great equalizer, if you're trying to undermine an institution so vital to the survival of democracy and the future of our nation, then there's going to be an equal and opposite reaction. My friends, we're going to have to come in stronger. We're going to have to get louder. We're going to have to work harder. We're going to have to serve families better. And together, we're going to have to raise the bar higher. Thank you. Y pa'lante. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
racist critical race theory. Why don't you go in there and thrash the teacher? Like this is and how bad our teachers are in the inner city. I don't know how they got degrees. You know, I, I don't negotiate with the teachers union. They're a terrorist organization. The most dangerous person in the world is Randy Weingarten. Oh. So that's the former Secretary of State. Are you a mother? I am a mother by marriage. You're just a political activist, not a Gentle teacher, lady. not a mother. Show up to your school board meeting. Who pays your salary? I'm talking about really raunchy stuff. Kids and lessons on gender inclusivity. And your children have vivid pornography. The fifth grade teacher in Florida who is currently under investigation for showing a Disney film to her class. Violating parts of the law could lead teachers to be charged with a felony. We're at a crossroads. Fear and division, or hope and opportunity. Four strategies can help transform our schools to realize the promise and purpose of public education. I believe community schools are really important because we are focusing on the whole child, so not just uh, academics. We're focusing on the child, social, emotional well-being, physical health. We need to make sure that they're set up for success, so that includes our families. We're first responders for everything that happens in community now. For example, we have students who don't have winter coats. We have food giveaways. We know that if a student is hungry, then their brains are not necessarily going to work as best as it can. We have partnerships with Southwest Family Guidance to do health and mental health counseling. We need to educate the whole student, their mind, their body, intellectual self, psychological person. And when you know something's triggering you, get into your bag of tools before you get upset. Right. Now these I want to make sure my kids, particularly my kids with mental health issues, leave here equipped to handle life and to earn a living. I see the brilliance of my students if given that opportunity to overcome those obstacles that they face, that wraparound services can help. We need to create ways for kids to want to be in school, whether it's music, art, or whether it's robotics, enabling it for all kids, as opposed to a system of testing, 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 testing. They're learning parametric modeling. Uh, in a 3D environment. It opens up a new area of the brain, but I feel like this course really helps you understand your potential. Kids like doing things. It's so much more fun to do it instead of just go through the theoretical part in a book. You can learn how it works, really. It's like you get to work on it hands-on and you can physically move everything. It's a great pathway for students who would like to work with their hands, be active, not sit as much, and have a potential career coming right out of high school. We should have opportunities in the trades. I'm a guest instructor here at Randolph Career Tech. We teach the basics, bricklayer basic masonry concepts. What better way to teach a young bricklayer is the Bricklayers Union. This is work that's going to pay you well. This is work that's going to take care of your family. We're bringing third to fifth graders into the welding shop, and then the, the fourth day, we turn the kids loose with a welder. And then I had to weld both of these sides. Get so excited, you see how excited they are about it. Yeah. If we touch workforce development with kids early and often, they will be more prepared as they grow within their school time. to take over our school district, we fought together. The power of all of us showing up and testifying at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education against receivership really helped push back. VTU compartió su poder conmigo y decidió que mi voz no fuera apagada. También nos dimos cuenta de qué tan poderosa es la unión de los padres y los maestros. On this Juneteenth, it's not just about Celebrating is about making change. We've got to be certain we're supporting our teachers. Labor matters and I 
Activism matters. We cannot do this work alone. And so we do that by having our community partnerships and our affiliations. I am announcing today in Pico Rivera that we're going to do this in 2023, give away another million books. It is about kids being joyful through reading. There you go. You like that one? Great thing about these books are they're very diverse. They're books that look like children in the neighborhood. That is really dope. Finding out that it's the teachers' union. This is showing that extra step, the beyond step. A parent, a community member, and an educator. And we have the same vested interest in pushing our students forward. In America today, over half of our public schools are understaffed, where there are major shortages of teachers. Because we have a shortage of professional working conditions, we have a shortage of pay, but we also have a shortage of respect and dignity and voice. This program creates the leaders of the future. The Teacher Leader Program enhances what, what is already in teachers, is that leadership quality. And there are so many issues with this system. That kind of bystander effect of somebody else will fix it. This program really helped me take personal responsibility for change within the district. There's direct support for teachers inside of the school community. We train coaches inside of their school buildings where they can offer tailored professional development. Sadly, we're losing teachers who are saying, you know what, I'm not being supported properly, and here is a place you can go. It's built in support right here in the school. Let's raise beginning teacher salaries to $60,000, and let's start valuing our teachers and creating a living wage Senate Bill 1 became law. This bill will increase the minimum teacher salary by $10,000. You are governor. Michelle. You showed up every single day. Compensation is one of the ways, not the only way, but one way that we attract and retain teachers. When others ignore crushing student debt, we give our members the tools to eliminate it. My debt is forgiven $144,462. That was completely forgiven through PSLF. And it just now motivates me to even move even more for our members. I am forever grateful for my union. There are 22 students in Newark today. They will also receive signing contracts to be my teachers in 2027. And I watched you go through the Red Hawks Rising Academy. You leave me speechless and hopeful and in awe of who you are. Mr. Governor, you can't ban books. You can't take away the freedom to learn, the freedom to choose who you are. Well, I had a little fourth grader come up and said, can you tell me what's the best mystery book in your library? And I froze because I didn't know if I could answer that question. The continuing hostile environment, teachers, not just in Florida, but everywhere, don't want to enter the profession anymore. We here are about hope and opportunity, about seeing our children, about making sure that people can read books our history. We will not let the governor of the state of Florida take away our freedom. We will not let the governor of the state of Florida silence us. We will speak up. We will speak out. We will speak in one voice. And now, please welcome Janisha Scott, Amir Billups, and Melissa Diamedia. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amir Billups. 
I'm the chairperson of the social studies department at University High School in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> I'm also a teacher educator, a leader in our CTE program, and I have the honor of heading the Red Hawks Rising Teacher Academy at University. Red Hawks Rising is a partnership between University and Eastside High Schools, Newark Public Schools, Montclair State University, and the American Federation of Teachers. The goal is to create a pipeline of teachers for the Newark schools by growing our own. Some students participate in the Red Hawks Rising because they are already interested in becoming teachers. Others join because they see the opportunity to get college experiences and credits early on and because of the academic benefits of the programs that we highlight. I believe what hooks young people also is our focus on developing their voices to be agents of change in their community and the relationships that they build with educators that they meet along their way in the academy. The other thing that hooks students is when they start to interact with the elementary school kids. One way in particular is through the Book Buddies program at both University and Eastside High Schools. Freshmen in the program walk to the local elementary schools and they go there for story time using books provided by the AFT and First Book. They get training on the best practices for promoting literacy and they also learn how to encourage sound reading habits for the elementary age children. But there's a deeper impact the elementary students get really excited about the book buddies and they look forward to being with the older students. Thus, the students in the Red Hawk Rising program become mentors to the younger kids. Red Hawks Rising requires a significant time commitment from our students. It's a time when many of them will be working. AFT and specifically Randy Weingarten didn't want financial burdens to prevent students from participating in the Teacher Academy. So we're grateful that the AFT has generously provided stipends for many of the Red Hawks Rising students. <laughs> Clap that up. It was a huge benefit to getting the program off the ground at that time. We hope this program will continue to produce uh, teachers so that we can address the teacher shortage. But the students who go through this program, I just want to highlight a couple of things because they're not just any teachers. Most of our students are black and brown. And we know that the presence of teachers of color in the classroom are linked to positive academic and social emotional outcomes. And we see the many benefits when teachers come back to educate students in their own communities. So it is my pleasure to introduce a 2023 graduate of University High School's Teacher, Edu Teacher Academy program. Someone I'm very proud of, Janasia Scott. Thank you, Mr. Billups. I want to thank you for everything you have done for me. You helped me set my priorities straight and gave me the push to finish strong with everything going on senior year. You're a great teacher, and I just want to thank you for that. My name is My name is Janasia Scott. I graduated at the top of my class from University High School last month. In this fall, I will enter Montclair State University's highly selective nursing program. My, my mom is a nurse, and I grew up around her nursing friends, so it's not surprising that, I, that I'm studying to become a nurse practitioner. But Mr. Billups and the Red Hawk Rising program helped me realize that I have a passion for both nursing and teaching. My hope is to create a program for high school students to teach about careers in nursing. I am grateful, from, I'm grateful to everyone, from Mr. Billups to AFT President Randy Weingarten, for making Red Hawks Rising possible. I would like to introduce another proud graduate of Newark Public Schools, my fellow Red Hawk, Melissa D. Almeida.
Hello, AFT. I am Melissa D. Almeida. I graduated from Newark's Eastside High School in 2022 with a near-perfect GPA through hard work, the support of my wonderful parents and sister, and the great education I received from my amazing teachers. I am a rising sophomore at Moncur State University. I am pursuing a bachelor's degree in education foundations for elementary teachers with the goal of becoming a bilingual K-6 teacher. I have always wanted to be a teacher, and I'm so fortunate that Red Hawks Rising gave me a jump start on making that a reality. I graduated from high school with 12 college credits and with connections to faculty and staff at Moncur State who are supporting me on my journey, who, by the way, are members of the AFT. The summer before my freshman year, I took classes at Moncur State through Red Hawks Rising, and this summer I am working at MSU Center of Pedagogy. My teachers have not only helped me helped to give me a great start in life, but they have inspired me to do that for the next generations. I am so grateful for the experience and support I have received through Red Hawks Rising. That would not have been possible without the investment and commitment of the AFT, led by a woman who not only fights for students and educators of today, but for the bright future for generations to come. I am so proud to introduce the president of American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten. do what we do. so short, so I'm moving the microphones. So thank you, Janeza, Melissa, Amir. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, all the staff that put together Teach this year. Thank you, all of you, for being here at Teach. It's our first time in person and at in-person teach since 2019. And yeah, I was gonna say this has been a tough year, what, but what a few tough years. I, I just wanna also say thank you to um, two other people here. Um, the secretary is on his way home uh, to be with his family this weekend. He doesn't get to do that often. So we work things out that he would be my lead in speech. Not normally how we would have done it, but you see who he is and how he has really fought the fight for public education and for public educators and for parents and for kids. And I wanna just say thank you to Secretary Cardona. His wife, by the way, is a member, and he was a member of the AFT. And the other person I want to thank, who I don't get to see all the time, is my wife, Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum, who is here in the front row. She was supposed to be doing Friday night services tonight, and we are here instead. And I just wanna say, just like all of you, families are so important to us, and she has been an incredible, incredible soulmate for me, particularly this year. Thank you, Chuck. And I'll get to why in a second. But look, you know, we're here, Yes, I know we have popcorn in back, 
But how do you reward yourself doing, during your time off? You've signed up for, yes, some sizzling professional development <laughs> in sweltering Washington, D.C. But that's who educators are. We work together to improve our craft. We recharge through our connection and camaraderie. And I think that's what keeps us going. And it's the same with me. After Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State and CIA director, so he knows better, after he called me the most dangerous person in the world, our members had my back. And, and I love this. You know, teachers being teachers reached out telling me others who were so labeled. Mother Jones, the most dangerous woman in America. Walter Ruther, the most dangerous person in Detroit. Martin Luther King Jr., the most dangerous black man in America. You're, you're getting my point. People sent these to me all the time. But why were they dangerous? Because they challenged deprivation and discrimination. They fought, they fought for a better life for their families and their communities. And I am honored to be in their courageous, righteous company. This company includes all of you and teachers and school staff across the country. And let me say this as clearly as I can. The malicious attacks and outright lies to which our members have been subjected are appalling and disgusting. So why? Why have Pompeo and the president he served, I won't say his name, and others unleashed this vitriol against educators and their unions? Remember at the beginning of the pandemic, parents showered praise on teachers and school staff. People saw just how essential the special connection between educators and public schools are with kids, families, and communities. And then the far right wing started their smears. It's no accident. As extremists try to divide Americans from one another, they know that public schools unite us. As they wage culture wars in our schools, parents know we have children's best interest at heart. We teach. We help young people learn how to think critically, to discern fact from fiction, to be curious, tolerant, to learn the basics, and to discover their potential and their passion. That's why 90% of parents send their children to public schools. Most parents trust teachers, and they want public schools to be strengthened, not privatized. So why? Why do extremists demonize, distort, and demagogue public education? And why don't they offer a single idea to strengthen public schools? The answer, my friends, is pretty clear to me. Because they don't want to improve public education, they want to end it. When they're not trying to slash public school funding, they are diverting it through vouchers to private and religious schools. And that's despite the evidence that vouchers do not improve achievement, that voucher schools often discriminate against children and families, and that vouchers siphon funds from already underfunded public schools. If there's one thing you remember from this speech today, remember what Christopher Rufo said. This is the guy who invented the conflict 
over critical race theory. And I quote, to get to universal school choice, you really need to operate from a premise of universal public school distrust. Just grok that. And toward that end, he said, you have to be ruthless and brutal. Distrust, ruthless, brutal. That's the playbook of fear mongers who call hard working teachers rumors and say we teach filth. That's the playbook of the cultural warriors who censor honest history and ban books like petty autocrats who pretend racism doesn't exist. That's the playbook of bullies who target and torment LGBTQ kids and families. That's the playbook of those who want to end public education as we know it. And while the fear mongers are out of step with the vast majority of parents and the public, they are determined, well-funded, and yes, ruthless. And nowhere do you see this more than in Florida. So, Governor Ron DeSantis I guess he's not popular in this crowd. <laughs> he hopes his anti-teacher war on woke will propel him to the White House. And it wasn't enough for him to ban students from taking AP African American studies, ripping the course out of students in Miami mid-year. Now, and you just heard Secretary Cardona talk about the Vice President being in Florida today. Now, he's whitewashing black history with this new African American history standard that says enslaved people develop skills that could be applied for their personal benefit. That is morally disgusting and outrageous. It's just unbelievable. And I'm glad, I'm glad the Vice President is down in Florida today calling it out. Thank you. Then there's groups like Moms for Liberty This audience has had its Cheerios today, <laughs> which was founded in Florida, and which, by the way, is labeled extremist by the Southern Poverty Law Center. They're attempting to ideologically take over school boards. So you may have heard of Shannon Rodriguez, who is a Hernando County School Board member backed by Moms for Liberty. Yeah, there's a reason why people are booing. She targeted, and you saw this on the video, a teacher for showing a Disney movie with a gay character. Well, Rodriguez also went after high school teacher Patty Greenwood for having stickers on her classroom door, including intertwined white and black hands wearing rainbow nail polish. Because like you, Patty wants all her students to feel safe, welcome, and respected. And Patty, who is the treasurer of our union, is here today with her local president, Lisa Mazzario. Stand up, stand up. Thank you for your courage and righteousness. Let's show a little love. Let's show a little love to our Florida educators.
I'm not so good at the selfies, but let's see what happens. Thank you, Patty and Lisa, for being here. Ruthless and brutal is a thing in Washington as well. Yes, I remember that. Now in April, some members of Congress called me in to testify. It was a whole hearing in my name. Now, was it about how to help kids learn? No. About the resources schools needed? No. About school infrastructure or civics or community schools? No and no. They wanted to place blame for school closures during the pandemic, not on the pandemic, or on officials who prioritized or prioritized opening bars and gyms over schools. Nope. They wanted to make teachers, teacher unions, and me their political punching bag. Now, never mind the facts, never mind that in April 2020, a month after the pandemic shut down schools and most of society, AFT released a comprehensive plan of action to reopen schools and do it safely. Safe for you and safe for our kids. And, and this one just blows my mind. Never mind all the work you did during the pandemic to meet your students' needs. And, and never mind that educators understood long before the pandemic the value of in-person teaching learning and connecting with students. Frankly, if certain members of Congress didn't interrupt as much as they did, I would have testified about everything we did during the pandemic to reopen schools safely, to secure the support kids and families needed, and what we all need to do to get it right if, God forbid, there is a next time. But. Indulge me for a moment. Let's imagine I had a modicum of the power they ascribed to me. Here's what I would do. <laughs> I'd make sure every school has enough counselors, nurses, librarians, therapists, teachers, bus drivers, and other support staff. Wait. That every kid has a rich curriculum that embeds joy and resilience, arts, sports, clubs, recess, field trips, summer camps, and a whole lot more. I'd abolish all unnecessary paperwork for teachers. There'd be lower class sizes and less standardized testing and it wouldn't be high stakes. And the professionals who teach and support America's children would be treated with the respect they deserve, and the wages they and their families can live on comfortably. And while we're at it, we do the same for every family in America. <laughs> Alas, I don't possess those powers. But together, we do have a superpower. Because in our union, in our democracy, we can achieve things together that are impossible alone. That's the essence of unionism showing up when it counts, fighting, caring, and working together for the things that make life better for our students, our families, our communities, and our society. The responsibilities placed on your shoulders probably feel impossible at times. It can be daunting to help even one child who's suffering with anxiety or who's struggling academically. Yet you, every single day, give your all to meet the needs of all your students, too often without the supports you and your students need and deserve. Even before the pandemic, the United States had a youth 
mental health crisis and a crisis of lagging student achievement, particularly for marginalized youth. The COVID pandemic and its consequences, it's exacerbated loneliness, learning loss, absenteeism, and so much more. No one has to cite drops in test scores or attendance for us to know that students aren't recovering as fast as we'd like and that many of our kids aren't okay. Educators and families know the condition of our children better than anyone. Helping kids recover and thrive is your priority. I've seen it in classrooms from coast to coast and in between. What I've witnessed, what ever educators like you have shown me, what research has proven, all form a set of strategies and solutions that have and will help young people and will also strengthen public education. But, and I was glad to hear the Secretary talk about it today, it has to be a national priority. And it has to be our union's priority. And you know this, too often things get so siloed in education, like we're going to work on academic learning there, or here, or here, and then we're going to work on social and life skills there. But brain science, and frankly common sense, <laughs> show that physical health, emotional wellness, and feelings of connectedness, they all influence academic learning. In fact, they influence all learning. Our brains aren't siloed, and our schools shouldn't be either. So, so how can we do this? We can by committing to these five essential solutions that meet kids' needs and committing to try to do them together. First, unlocking the power and possibility that comes from being a confident reader. Second, second ensuring that all children have opportunities to learn by doing. We call it experimental or experiential learning but it's what we do in CTE all the time, career tech ed all the time. Third, caring for young people's mental health and well-being, including by demanding that social media companies protect, not prey on children. Fourth, catalyzing a vast expansion of community schools that meaningfully and meaningfully partner with families. And fifth, of course, by fighting for the teaching and support staff and the resources students need to thrive. Now, I'm going to talk about each one of them briefly. But these are the foundations of the $5 million year-long campaign the AFT is launching today called Real Solutions for Kids and Communities. These are strategies that will address loneliness and learning loss and literacy. And we can and will do everything to spread and sustain them. We'll visit classrooms and communities across the country, lifting up these solutions and the countless other things you do every day to help kids succeed. So, this starts with reading, the foundation for all academic learning. AFT's Reading Opens the World program, in partnership with First Book, you've already heard, we've given out, Many of you participate in this. One and a half million books already last year. And our goal is another million by July 2024. So two and a half million books. So sharing the joy of reading when kids and families choose their own books at these events, it's one of the best endorphin rushes 
you could have, at least if you're a teacher. The wonder in kids' eyes, the smiles on their faces. But getting books in young people's hands, it's just a start. The ability to read is a fundamental right, and teaching children to read is the most fundamental responsibility of schooling. You know, anyone who's been here for a long time knows that the AFT has been advocating for and training educators on evidence-based approaches to reading instruction for decades. That science of reading points to a systematic approach that includes phonics instruction, along with giving students plenty of opportunities to read interesting and high-quality books, to develop their background knowledge, and to build their vocabulary. But these principles must be included in teacher prep programs, in curricula, and in high-quality professional development. So while some districts continue to ignore the science of reading or think tutoring alone will boost literacy, the good and frankly surprising news is that our country is on the cusp of the most comprehensive approach to reading ever. New research that we released this week from the Albert Schenker Institute evaluated state laws all across the country. And it shows, frankly, real consensus in this evidence-based approach. And school districts, such as New York and Detroit, are pledging to teach reading using that evidence-based approach. Now, that's all good news, but teachers need to be supported in this work. The change is not going to happen overnight. So, AFT is committed to fighting for, but also providing opportunities for teachers to learn, practice, and be mentored in evidence-based approaches. A lot of you are doing that this weekend. But we're also investing in an exciting new project called Reading Universe. Now, this is being led by one of our longtime partners, WETA, along with First Book and the Barksdale Reading Institute, whose work in Mississippi has moved fourth grade reading achievement from the bottom of the country up to the national average. Reading Universe, you're going to see all sorts of stuff about it today and tomorrow. Reading Universe is an online, step-by-step -step pathway for teachers, paraprofessionals, and reading coaches to learn more about evidence-based reading instruction and then to use it in your classrooms to complement any curriculum. It offers videos filmed in real classrooms with real kids in diverse settings across the country. There'll be a focus on serving English learners, students with dyslexia and other learning issues, and students from marginalized communities. Reading Universe will offer educators everywhere access to strategies and skills that enable them to help kids to be confident, joyful readers, regardless of the curriculum your district or school requires. And it's been built from the start with a cadre of skilled teachers and researchers. So you can tell by this run-up that I am thrilled to announce the launch of this powerful tool today. And, and, don't get your Apple payout because it's free. Yes, free and available online to every educator because all students need and deserve high quality literacy instruction. So we're making it available not just to our members, but to everybody. Reading, as important as it is, is just one part of the Real Solutions for Kids and Communities campaign. We know, and some of you have heard me talk about experiential learning for a while, but we know that many kids are disengaged and many don't want to go to school. You get it and I get it. There's lots of school experiences that don't interest or inspire young people. But 
not in Raphael von Ohm's classroom. Raphael, who's here with us now, teaches third grade at School Within School right here in DC, and he is an AFT civics design teach team member. We have this AFT civics design team. Raphael's students learn about local government by role playing that they are DC council members addressing real issues affecting their city. So any of you who have those issues from this weekend, I'll introduce you to Raphael. At the end of third grade, his students create DC tour companies, researching the city's historical sites, and then they role play how they would attract people to take their tour, third graders. Denise Pfeiffer, a high school chem teacher in Cincinnati, she's here today too, she creates escape rooms in her classroom. And her students work in pairs, and to get out, they have to solve puzzles that embed the content that they have learned. And why are they both here today? Because both Raphael and Denise are presenting at Teach. These, these are examples of experiential learning, and many of us want to do this. I had students in my street law classes at Clara Barton High School role play housing court mock trials. And in my AP Gov course, my students acted out mock appellate court arguments. But now, in the age of AI and chat GPT, this type of learning is essential to being able to analyze information, think critically, apply knowledge, and discern fact from fiction. Experiential learning engages students in deeper learning. It provides them with real world, real life skills, and it boosts academic achievement. And I heard people talk, you know, say this as I was talking about CTE, because career and technical education is project-based experiential learning at its best, and it's a 21st century game changer. And why? Because CTE pre prepares students not only for traditional trades like welding, plumbing, carpentry, auto repair, but also careers in healthcare, culinary, advanced manufacturing, aeronautics, IT, graphic design, and so much more. And it works. 94% of students who concentrate in CTE graduate from high school, and 72% of them go to college. So, last month, AFT's CTE committee visited Lynn Vocational and Technical High School in Massachusetts. S students in that culinary program catered a delicious sit-down breakfast for our group of 40 visitors. And we saw beautiful port swings and sheds handcrafted by carpentry students, and students demonstrated their knowledge of plumbing and pipe fitting. My point is this. These young people graduate from high school with lots of options and opportunities. In Syracuse, New York, I was wondering where the New Yorkers were. <laughs> A new plant is being built by the semiconductor manufacturer, Micron. It's going to create tens of thousands of jobs. At the AFT's initiative, Micron is partnering with school systems and teacher unions in New York to develop a curriculum framework that prepares high school students for engineering and technical careers. And we're working with the region's school systems to develop the teacher training necessary to teach this curriculum. In rural Southeast Ohio, again, with the help of our union, schools in New Lexington have expanded CTE to include everything from robotics for third graders, yes, third graders, to a partnership with the IBW to train high school students for in-demand electrical jobs. Now, their graduation in this district, since we've started this, has shot up to 
and 30% of the students earn college credits before high school graduation. My point is this, in telling you these three stories, is that by being intentional about this, starting by high school, partnering with employers, creating paid internships, and offering industry-approved credentials or college credit, just like you saw with Red Hawk, we can set young people on many paths right out of high school. After all, preparing kids for college, career, civic participation in life, isn't that the job of public schools? So, if you've been empowered to engage in experiential learning with your students, you know how transformational it is. And you know that standardized, test-based accountability systems can't capture the richness of experiential learning. So, as I have advocated repeatedly and will do again today, we need to reimagine our accountability systems to assess what is needed in today's world, not yesterday's. The ability to communicate, to work cooperatively, to think critically, to troubleshoot, to be creative. These are lifelong skills that will enable students to thrive no matter what the future holds, no matter what the next version of AI brings, no matter the challenges they may face. Experiential learning prepares students for opportunities of tomorrow, and community schools help solve the challenges students and families confront today. Hunger, housing insecurity, trauma, physical health problems, even the lack of clean clothing, you know this, they all negatively affect children's ability to learn. And now, after the isolation, stress, and for many young people, the loss of loved ones during the pandemic, the needs are greater. I know you are heroic. I am in countless classrooms and schools year after year. You do it all. Who here keeps snacks when students are hungry? Who's had to interrupt your teaching to comfort a student who's distraught? Who, who's had students with a health or a family problem that interfered with their learning? So, how about this concept? Who would welcome having support services in your school that meet kids' needs and that allow you to focus on teaching? That's what community schools do. Community schools can wrap so much around public schools. Don't think if you're starting it for the first time you're going to do all of this at the same time. But it can wrap healthcare and mental health services and food assistance and childcare and enrichment and tutoring and sports and after school activities. What its intent is is to support what students and families need to learn, to live, and to thrive. And through meaningful partnerships with families and deep community engagement, they become centers of their communities. So, a few other stories. United Community Schools, a network of community schools in New York City. They have expanded, yes, they're here, into Albany. But those schools have higher rates of vulnerable students than other public schools. And yet they perform better on measures like college readiness and the progress of English language learners and students with disabilities. And this is likewise in San Francisco as well. Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School. Before it became a community school in 2015, MLK struggled with enrollment and academics and educators were burnt out. Now, with support from 40 community partners, there's been significant increases in math and reading scores at MLK, and teachers are choosing to stay. So, what did the United Educators of San Francisco do? They saw the possibilities and worked with a community coalition to pass Prop G last November 
which expands this community school model. And when I, those of you who remember, it feels like an eternity ago, but when I advocated for a broad expansion of community schools, yes, I look much younger, in my first speech as AFT president in 2008, our North Star was Cincinnati. Today, there's a constellation of community schools, Albuquerque and Albany, El Paso and Pittsburgh, Messina and McDowell. AFT members have helped create more than 700 community schools across the country, and we are part of a movement calling for 25,000 community schools by 2025. So, we're fighting to make community schools the norm, not the exception. And we have allies in this fight. California is investing an additional $4 billion into community schools. You heard the secretary, President Biden doubled federal funding for community schools. And you knew I wouldn't do a speech today without talking about Chicago. And Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson CTU and AFT's own is dramatically expanding the district's community school program with the goal of all district schools functioning as community hubs through community partnerships. So, while community schools can provide a safe and supportive physical environment for young people, there's an environment that threatens their physical and emotional well-being, and that's social media and the online world. Even before the pandemic, many experts connected the harmful impacts of social media and the nefarious practices of social media companies to the youth mental health crisis. We all know social media has its benefits. And you all know I overuse Twitter. <laughs> but research has shown that teens who spend more than three hours per day on social media are at double the risk for experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety. Social media can increase bullying, diminish people's ability to interact face to face. It's been tied to eating disorders, suicidal thoughts, and feelings of being less than or left out. And too many kids have an addictive relationship with social media that families can't fix on their own. Schools are also grappling with an increase in dangerous and disruptive behavior linked to social media, such as those viral challenges. Challenges to destroy school property or slap a teacher or to swat that's the one that encourages students to report hoax shootings. They're dangerous and they're traumatic for students, staff, and families. And all of this detracts from our primary mission, which is to protect and educate our kids. So, as schools are struggling to hire mental health professionals, and to provide the training that teachers need to better support students with mental health issues, we're calling on social media companies to step up. Social media companies have shirked their responsibility to protect kids. Facebook's own research showed how their algorithms harmed users, especially adolescent girls. Did they change their practices to protect kids based upon what they knew? No, they hit it. These companies must protect young people, not prey on them for profit. It's, it's just not enough to issue a press release promising to improve the viewing experience when recommended for you feeds, send content that glorifies eating disorders, or to settle lawsuits with families grieving for children who received unsolicited videos about suicide. So, the AFT is taking action, and we're not doing this alone. Together, with Parents Together, 
which is a platform of five million parents. Fair Play for Kids, Design It for Us, and the American Psychological Association. We are calling on social media platforms to make fundamental changes to prioritize safety for children. Our report, which you can get on the internet, I almost said you could get on social media. Our report is called Likes Versus Learning, The Real Cost of Social Media for Schools, and it calls for the following safeguards. One, turning on the strongest safety features by default. So making them the default feature. Two, changes that deter students from addictive behavior like eliminating autoplay, and indefinite scroll. Three, protect children's privacy. Four, shield children from risky algorithms. And five, what a concept, work with schools and families. Social media companies could implement all of these things right now. And our coalition of students and educators and parents won't let up until they implement these safeguards. I'm glad that Parents Together is with us today. And by the way, so is Reading Universe. And I'm also glad that many students are with us here today, including, and Ryan, I want you to stand up, 15-year-old Ryan Lumber from Oregon. Now. Ryan makes and sells art to fund her program to make everyone in her school community feel welcome and to bridge differences between people. Ryan and Patty, I want you to meet each other. And this is my point. When we join in common cause and common purpose with parents and educators and students and employers and faith leaders and the broader community, we multiply our power to achieve our shared goals. That's why fearmongers and demagogues try so hard to divide. But it takes work to create this trust. But it's transformational. Look at New Haven, where educators and families went to the state capitol together to fight back against school privatization and for much needed education investments. You saw some of this on the video as well, and look at the Michigan Education Justice Coalition, which has trained thousands of people to get involved in their school boards. Thousands of parents and educators, from Yonkers, New York, to ABC in California, from Houston to Detroit. We have fought, and you have fought, in collaboration and partnership for the schools our kids need. Of course, we must continue to work collectively to combat the leading cause of death for children. That cause, the leading cause of death for children in the U.S., is firearms. Parties, parades, concerts, classrooms. These are all places where our children should feel safe. All places that have been devastated by gun violence. So here's an idea not so novel, let's ban assault weapons, not books. <laughs> Last one. What I'm about to say is obvious to all of you, but we have to fight for it. We need appropriate funding for our public schools and we need the three R's, educator recruitment, retention, and respect. So the AFT teacher and school staff shortage report that we released last year, it's chock full of solutions. Family sustaining wages, time to plan and prepare for classes, time to collaborate with colleagues, time to participate in meaningful and in-school professional development and the power to make day-to-day -day classroom decisions. It's easy to see what's needed. What's hard 
is making it happen. But we have in recent collective bargaining contracts. The United Teachers of Los Angeles new contract includes higher pay and smaller class sizes, more funding for community schools, and support for vulnerable students. In New York City, you know, they have an, they have an over under on how long the speech is, but you knew I couldn't mention a speech without talking about my home local. So, in New York City, the UFT's new contract, okay, okay. <laughs> it increases pay and it provides more ways for teachers to engage with parents and to support multilingual learners and students with disabilities. The St. Paul Federation of Educators won an agreement for all schools to have mental health support teams. And the Cincinnati Federation of Teachers contract requires an instructional leadership team in every school that puts decisions about school operations and improvement in the hands of those closest to students. We have allies in this fight, including the fight to pay educators more. You heard the secretary. Then there's New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, who enacted a $10,000 raise for all teachers in New Mexico. And then Senator Bernie Sanders and Florida Representative Frederica Wilson, who proposed bills that would raise teacher salaries. And don't forget, President Joe Biden, who called on lawmakers to give public school teachers a raise during his State of the Union address. In years past, when I and others advocated for higher pay for teachers and adequate and equitable education funding, the right wing, even before I'd finish, had a tweet out there that said, or a press release out there that said, money doesn't matter. But evidence does matter, and I admire those willing to follow it like researcher Eric Hanischek, who argued for decades that more funding didn't lead to better education outcomes. But he has made a stunning turnaround. Hanischek has reviewed the most rigorous research on education funding and finds what you and I know, which is that money does, in fact, matter. As the Albert Shanker Institute documented a decade ago, research shows that when schools get more money, student achievement goes up. But, but, others still operate ideologically because as we speak, House Republicans are trying to cut billions in funding for public education. Yes. It's going to hurt preschoolers, English language learners. But I don't know if you actually heard what the secretary said. It's going to cost what they propose will cost, cause unconscionable harm to the millions of children from low income families. Because what are these lawmakers proposing? An 80% cut to Title I. 80%. That's not a typo. It's inexcusable. It's defunding public schools. And I am so grateful to all of you who lobbied on Capitol Hill yesterday to turn this around. Because public education must be supported, not stripped. And thankfully, we have allies here too. President Biden's budgets reflect his unwavering support for public schools. Illinois Governor Pritzker signed a budget last month with an additional $570 million for K-12 education. Minnesota Governor Walsh approved $2.2 billion in new K-12 spending over the next two years. And get this one if you haven't been following it. In Wisconsin, Republican politicians are reeling over the clever way Governor Tony Evers, a teacher, by the way, 
increased per pupil spending for the next 400 years. Hashtag elections matter. So the solutions I've outlined are worthy on their own. Together, they're transformational. Reading truly opens the world. Community schools help students and their families thrive. Experiential learning prepares young people to seize the opportunities in our changing economy. And student circle of care, working together so we can address learning loss and loneliness and fight the culture wars, gun violence, and unrestrained social media. Educators supported, respected, and compensated befitting their essential role and adequate funding. Those are the elements of the Real Solutions for Kids and Communities campaign we're launching today. And look, we know how to run contract campaigns, and we know how to run political campaigns. Let's put that same energy and expertise into this campaign to win these solutions for our kids, for educators like you, for our public schools and our democracy. Because without public schooling, without the pluralism it creates, without the opportunity it provides, there will be no freedom in America and there will be no broad-based multiracial democracy. So, it's a long speech to do an ask. This is my ask of you. We need you to tell your stories and showcase the great things happening in your classrooms. Just like I told stories today, we want to lift up the teaching and learning happening all over. We want to lift up these foundational strategies and solutions. We need them. We need to embed them and collect a bargaining and enshrine them into district policies and state laws so they can be scaled and sustained. And I bet as we address hard issues like loneliness, literacy, and learning loss, we'll not only have long-term allies rooting for us, but the people who have at times been at odds with us. Because everyone wants children to recover and thrive. And that's only possible when our beloved community comes together and supports, not smears, public education and educators. So, are you with me? Are you ready to tap into the literacy tools in Reading Universe? Are you ready to give kids great free books as others ban them? Are you ready to help kids with practical skills and critical thinking with experiential learning in your classrooms? Are you ready to make community schools the norm? Are you ready to take on social media companies? Are you ready to join this campaign to make every public school in America a safe, welcoming, and joyful place where educators are respected and supported, parents want to send their kids, and students thrive? So, no one no one can do all of this, but we all can do something. And through our union, we can achieve great things together that would be impossible alone. So, please, my friends, colleagues, family, never ever forget in this fight between hope and fear, between aspiration and despair, between light and darkness, you are the hope. You are the aspiration. You are the light. 
thank you for everything you do and have a wonderful teach. I've been living with the reading crisis for my whole career. First as a teacher, then as a principal in Oakland Unified City Schools, and now as an advocate for teachers and kids with the NAACP, where we promote social justice for all children and protect their civil rights. In all that work, my goal has been the same. What can we do to get the greatest number of kids reading and writing proficiently? Helping more kids learn to read is cause of my lifetime. And I know AFT has been leading that charge for years, actually for decades. Like you, I've seen the pain that results when even a single child struggles with reading. On the flip side, I've seen the joy and pride that children feel when they do learn how to read and write well. So my goal is to make sure that every child has a fair chance to experience that success. It's simple. And that's why I agreed to advise Reading Universe. That's why I'm here today. We can only solve our reading crisis if we give every teacher in every school and every district free instant access to authoritative and media rich information about what it really takes to teach reading well. Reading Universe is not a brand. It's not an ideology, it's not a commercial program. This is a place for professionals who want to get the job done. So Reading Universe has gathered the right team at the right time. With your help, your advice, your guidance, and your support, we really can make this work. Not just for the kids I love in Oakland, but for children all across the country, every race, every color, every creed. If you teach reading, you know how rewarding it can be. But you've probably also found that in every class, there will be students who really struggle with learning to read. Reading Universe is here to help. With expert guidance, we've developed a new framework to support educators everywhere. It's called the Reading Universe Taxonomy. How does this free professional resource work? It's built upon the leading research on how we learn to read. We are born with the ability to learn oral language, but making sense of the written word doesn't come naturally. So we need to teach students that the letters on a page represent the sounds we all use to speak with each other. The path to literacy is through word recognition. Children need to crack the alphabetic code using phonological awareness and phonics. They need to be able to hear that a spoken word like net is made up of separate sounds. N, e, t. That's phonological awareness. And they need to connect those sounds to the letters of the alphabet to see N, E, T and read net. That's phonics. But being able to read words is just one part of the process. Students also need to understand what the words mean. That's called language comprehension. As children gain more knowledge of the world around them, they begin to recognize more of the words that they sound out. Then they can build on their knowledge through more reading. Only students who develop word recognition and language comprehension can achieve reading comprehension. It takes both to become a good reader. Inside the Reading Universe Taxonomy, you'll find everything you need to know about how to teach the reading skills your students need to master. Each literacy component is broken down into its many skills and processes. For each skill, we show why it matters and how to teach it effectively. And we offer ideas for supporting students who need extra help. We don't just describe effective teaching, we show it with in-classroom video filmed in schools around the country. Ongoing assessment is critical to effective teaching. 
So we provide guidance for determining what each student needs and how to tailor your instruction to meet those needs. Reading comprehension is not just one skill. It's the product of all the many skills that we teach our children. We hope the Reading Universe Taxonomy will become your trusted go-to guide and that together we can give more children the chance to excel as readers and in their lives. This is Reading Universe. Good afternoon, AFT. My name is Ron Hobart. I am the proud member of United Teachers of Wichita, Local 725. And now I serve the members of Kansas as the state AFT Kansas president. Today, today we have an excellent story to share with you. Alma Rivera's. Good afternoon. My name is Alma Rivas, and I am a second grade teacher at Cloud Elementary in Wichita, Kansas. I am also a proud and longtime member of the United Teachers of Wichita. Last year, I volunteered to be part of a new and exciting after school reading program for families that my union had been hosting. It's a one on one virtual after school reading session for second and third grade students who need just a little extra boost. The program was developed by AFT and UTW member and a very dear friend, Tracy Callard, with full support from our school district. AFT's Reading Opens the World campaign is our key partner in our after school reading program. Teachers are paired up with families to encourage reading by giving families books for their home libraries. Teachers meet with the kids virtually to read out loud with them and providing tips and techniques to help them learn and read. I'm proud to say that this after school program has been a huge success. Yes. By giving diverse and fun books to families, plus the weekly contact has accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. Not only have kids' interests in reading skyrocketed, it has also helped rebuild parent-teacher relationships that were frayed during the pandemic. Yes, it has been so popular and effective that AFT Kansas is now working with six other school districts in our state to replicate the after school family reading program. As one of the teachers and now the coordinator of the program, I've personally seen the joy of parents, students and sibling and even family pets, yes, when they sit down together and read as a family. Not only have we given more than a thousand books to families in our community, but through our weekly video calls, we have made strong and lasting connections with our students and their parents. Parent engagement and confidence has gone way up because they now see themselves as part of their students' educational team. Also, the students participating in the program show significant improvement in their reading scores, especially compared to their peers who do not participate. But the best thing about it is that now, kids stop me in the hallway and ask, can I join the reading club? Can I get books too? It's amazing. And I'm so happy to be able to share this story with every one of you. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Castrillo, and this is my son, Javion. As a parent who participated in Wichita's Reading Opens with the World program, I just want to say thank you to the AFT for all that you have done to help spread the joy of reading in not just my hometown, but across the country. And thank you for Randy for coming out and visiting with us. AFT has given out 1.5 million books to families like mine. That's amazing. I've seen how the free books we've received and the support from teachers like Alma have really set Javion up for success. You have something you want to say? Come on. Come on. I love books. I love to read. Thank you, A AFT. And now, please use your teacher voice and give a warm welcome to the stage for our panelists. Kareem Weaver, Tanji Reed Marshall, and Alonzo Jaque Pino. So Kareem, say a few words before you get started with this wonderful panel. So I'll be quick. Um, I'm sure you probably heard a lot of chatter about literacy lately, about reading and how it's done, and you know who kind of gets to make decisions on how it's approached. It's in the news, the uh, New York Times, uh, movies have come out, et cetera, et cetera. Interestingly enough, AFT has been leading this fight for decades. Decades. The question is, why haven't folks been listening? It was the first item on President Weingarten's list for this new initiative. This is nothing new. It follows in the legacy of folks like Marva Collins and others who believe that all kids can learn if given the right direction and instruction and resources. I want to take just a quick second also to give AFT some flowers. You know, I was on Twitter last night. I probably shouldn't have done that. But I was on Twitter, and uh, the president had, President Weingarten had said something. It was nice. It was innocuous. It was, you know. And oh, my goodness. You'd have thought she dropped a bomb. I mean, it was like, oh, all kids can do this, and reading is important, et cetera, et cetera, and they just went in. So I guess what I want to say is, before we even get to the panel, it takes a lot of resilience and courage to be in this space of standing up for kids, not just individually, but also organizationally. People probably not going to pat you on the back. Unfortunately, that's just the way our society is. And so I think in, in that context, this organization really needs to take a bow and, and step into its own, not just authority, but duty, responsibility, and legacy around this issue. Okay, having said that, uh, I've been given an opportunity to introduce a couple of folks and have a, a quick discussion, if you, if, if you were. Um, Alonzo Jaque Peño and also Dr. Tanji Reed Marshall. Alonzo uh, has or is a teacher of English language learners, an Education Minnesota Roseville Union member, and an advisor. To Reading Universe, which you saw on the screen there a little bit earlier. Dr. Marshall is an educator, an author, an educational equity advocate, a former director of PK to 12 education practice at Ed Trust. Please help me welcome both of them to the stage. All right, let's jump into it. All right, Alonzo, you first. Man, so can you talk a little bit about 
your experience learning to read, how that informed your decision to become a teacher, and, and how you teach it yourself. So I believe we have to make this personal because it is something that we got to fix. And phonics is necessary. To be able to see the words and make sense of it, that's what works. Not guessing what the words are saying because of the picture. Let me tell you something. I learned phonics when I was in college. And then later on, it started making sense. What I was doing, why I was learning it, why I was reading how to, why I was reading, is because I was relying on my Spanish skills. Kindergarten, first grade, second grade, they do not have that. So it is time to do what works. It is time to give those kids the nap so they can open that door and be able to read. And that is what I want to do. And that is our message today. And that is what I believe. And how do I do it? I'm still figuring this out. Believe me, I do not have the magic wallet, right? But slowly but surely, I've been teaching, I've been focusing on learning phonics for me so I can give that to my, to my students. And that's why I'm so excited about Reading Universe because I will have that resource based with science, based with what works. You know, it's interesting. There's some people who will say, right, right message, but why is AFT saying it? You know, if, if you don't support that because you don't like AFT, you really need to look in the mirror. You really do. Because this organization has been supporting what you're saying for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And we got to put our, our priorities and our kids above whatever grievances people may have. And that's just the reality of it. Dr. Marsh, Dr. Reed Marsh, uh, can you talk briefly about what drives you and your interest in literacy? Thank you, and pleasure to be here. What drives me in literacy is the fact that if you can't read, there's a point at which you are at the mercy of others. And the degree to which a young person has the skills and the know-how to make sense of comprehensive and complex text is the degree that their future is in their own hands. And so it's really important when we think about what literacy is all about and why it is important for states, for districts and schools to have a deep understanding of the body of knowledge and the evidence base we call the science of reading so that they can have the kinds of structures and processes in place to support educator development and student positive outcomes so that we can stem the tide of this crisis, which has now become an avalanche of students not being able to take hold of their future because they have to rely on somebody else's belief about what should be done in the classroom in terms of what it means to get a child to learn how to read as, it, as opposed to them learning how to get the skill themselves. Well, I wonder, how, okay, you said a lot right <laughs> there. You said a lot. How, how do we get here? How did we get how, here? How do we get to the point where, I mean, administrators, district officials, even some teachers, like we have their own thinking about, re but it's not working. They're not doing the things you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we get here to this point? We got here to this point um, in a multifaceted, multi-layered way. So we have the psychological side that got us here, and then we have the technical side that got us here. So a lot of times the psychological side is going to drive the technical side. So we have been in crisis mode in reading for groups of students for centuries. When students weren't, when, when groups of people, well, I'll say this, when it was a criminal activity, okay for young people, for groups of people to learn how to read. That was a crisis then. Mm. That crisis was the foundation for the crisis of the ongoing, ever entrenched gap in outcome between groups of students. Then we have a crisis of what does it mean to actually be a reader and what does it take to do that? 
what are the dynamic components of it? So we talk about phonics, and we need phonics and phonemic awareness and vocabulary development and um, whole, uh, oral language development, and we also need comprehension. So we need to stop the adult mm -hmm. from fighting about what it means for there to be readers and understand that reading is a complex, multifaceted endeavor. The brain is not wired for reading. It is wired for the senses of which reading is not one. Mm. So reading takes up a lot of brain capacity. And because it takes up that capacity, we have to decide that we're going to live into and teach with the science of reading, the body of knowledge. Because we want to get hung up on the science and the language. Yeah. And people are saying, well, it's not science. There is an evidence base, a long runway mm -hmm. of an evidence base of knowledge about what it means to be a reader, how to teach the adults to teach the kids how to do it, and then we've got to get on with the business. And I ask this question a lot. Anybody in this room ever learn how to read? Raise your hand. Ask, okay, you over there learn how to read. Okay, great. <laughs> I ask that question because I want you to think about how you did that. There are times when the illustrations on the page are supporting casts. But if the supporting cast of images is released from the page, are kids going to still know how to read? And if the kids can't read without the, without the pictures, they're not necessarily doing the reading in a deep, comprehensive way. So we've got to help them do both of those in a deep, um, multi-layered way of getting young people to learn to do the thing we call reading. So that brings up something, Alonzo. You, I've heard you talk before um, about all the intricacies and complications involved with getting kids reading in a classroom. You know, lots of different levels. Kids are, you know, some are at the very beginning, some are a little bit more advanced. Can you talk about personally how do you deal with meeting the variety of needs? I know it starts with skills, but how do you actually, in a practical sense, can you just say more about that and, and why that's so important to be able to reach a range of learners and how you approach that? Well, no pressure. No pressure. Yeah. So from the perspective of teacher, it is hard. It is complicated. And it's a little bit frustrating. And you know why? Because there are not enough resources out there free resources that you can access to. And often, one of the things is that uh, some of the curriculums out there are so not updated mm. and so not easy to get to. They're in books. We teachers, we have a lot of things going on in the day. A lot of things going on in the day. We don't have time to know what it is. We want the information so we can apply it. So that's why I love, and I'm gonna do a plug-in again, because the resource of reading universe, and that is what it's giving us. It's giving us that tool to be creative with it, right. so we can really use that in our classrooms throughout the United States. You know, that's interesting. Because, I mean, we're playing it. I think they had the video when people were kind of moving around a little bit. Mm -hmm. No, so <laughs> folks actually saw it or not. But you mentioned Reading Universe. I know you're an advisor on Reading Universe. Yeah. And I believe it's free. It better be free. From what I heard, it's free. It is free, by the way, yeah. Right, it's free, thank you. And, and that gives access to teachers when they might not other ha otherwise have that access. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know what the district is going to buy, what, what the new curriculum is and what it's based on and what the methods are that they're being, that you're being evaluated on using. So to actually have something that's been vetted and improved and endorsed by AFT is huge. Yes. Is huge. So we, we have folks here from all over the country, mm -hmm. right? And then, of course, some people are listening online, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you had a message to them. I know you've accomplished a lot. Dr. Reed Marshall, in your writings and in your work and your advocacy, I'm wondering, do you have anything you'd like to leave them with as they're thinking about how to approach, how to 
how to approach literacy, but then also just how to put it in, the, in this movement of social justice and, and how important of an issue is it or is it not? Do you have anything yeah. to? Yeah, first of all, learning how to read is socially just. We can talk about social justice, but if a young person is in your charge and you have the honor and privilege to encounter them as a teacher and they are and they're not able to read when there are evidence-based practices and information out there, that is socially unjust. It is socially just for young people to have the power and agency to take hold of their lives by being literate. In my book about instructional power, the main point is educators have power to make decisions that afford or constrain access to educational opportunity. And every teacher, I was a member of AFT when I was in the, in the classroom in New Jersey, um, every teacher has the ability to enact instructional power when they make decisions about who does what in their classroom. And that is real and is evident. And so I would leave people with the understanding that that's important for them to deal with and, and, and understand that they've got it and they exercise it regularly. Thank you. Well, I'm going to ask you a question, brother. You know, I've, I've talked about lingual ed for a long time, and there's this uh, feeling for some, by some, it's, uh, I would call it pobrecito culture. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I pobrecito. Misplaced compassion. You know. Deep, from a deep sense of caring and empathy, but then also just feeling sorry for them. I hope to see. What can you really do? Look at how, you know. Um, and so, you know, let's just, just give them a snack and let them go play. <laughs> Be cool. But can you speak to, when we're talking about reading specifically, can you talk about the empowerment side of reading? That if you care about a child, how do we show up as educators? Um, it, it, I, I, there's, there's something there. I, mean, I have all the words, but there's something there. How best to empower children? And, you know, I would say literacy is a part of that. I'm wondering what you would say. So, uh, as educators, we have this phrase. It just clicks. Sit mm. there clicks. Things clicks. The students, they learn. They don't click. So, and to be able to do that, we have to do it systematically yes. based on science mm. because that's what works. Yeah. And if the students doesn't know how to read, they don't get to be humans. They don't get to be humans. They don't get to experience the world, how we're experiencing all of us here. Mm -hmm. So do not deny them of what is possible mm. because they don't have anything mm -hmm. and we have everything which is to teach them how to read and how do we start that by making them how to sound those words out trust me it's not the magic bullet again however it's that knob that you can open the door with and the knob when you're a little kid is pretty big but when you go to middle school and high school, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So please, give naps to all the students so they can open the doors by themselves mm. because they know what is good for them. We can just give them the skills for them to do that. It's a call to empowerment. Yes. As opposed to agency, as opposed yes. to just, you know, patting them on the back and saying, I, 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 I love you for that, brother, because it takes a lot of, it takes a, a mature, grounded person to say, I love you, and therefore, we're going to approach what's best for you like this. My heart is beating for you, and because I believe in you and I want you to have agency, this is what we're going to do. Listen, I just, I, I appreciate you both. And I'm just so grateful for AFT for not just this conference, but sponsoring Reading Universe, a chance for teachers to get on-demand multimedia access to what teachers need to serve students best without having to pay for it. You shouldn't have to get a second, third job. You shouldn't have to, especially not since you already spent money in school to get the certificate in the first place.
right? So I uh, applaud President Weingarten and those on the leadership team of AFT for taking lead on this. And I just thank you both for your service and for your offering us a few words uh, to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. session please make your way to the reception the receptions upstairs if you can make your way out thank you 